This video considers ancient maps in terms of what they can offer in history and archaeology research, as well as in terms of what makes them effective as popular parts of works of fiction and fantasy settings. At first glance, an ancient map may appear to be vague and inaccurate, especially when compared against modern-day standards of high-precision maps and photorealistic imagery. Modern maps tend to emphasize factual accuracy and precision, but ancient maps often were more concerned with the combination of artistic, factual, and possibly secretive qualities. Additionally, map-making tools and public access have changed through time. Ancient maps always require some amount of effort for interpreting or reinterpreting what was represented originally. The original representation may have involved distorted, imprecise, or possibly fantastical elements. At face value, these qualities may appear to diminish the practical use of an ancient map, yet simultaneously they convey a sense of wonder about who made the map and for what purpose. These wondrous aspects fit perfectly in fiction and fantasy settings, such as when characters attempt to decode an ancient treasure map or to follow the clues to find a long-lost city or a temple complex. In archaeology research, as well as in fiction and fantasy settings, an ancient map alone usually offers some or perhaps most of the essential information, but other separate knowledge will be necessary for unlocking or decoding the complete picture. A map literally could be missing a piece of the original work, thereby making the incomplete map difficult or impossible to use. Indeed, many old maps have been damaged or faded accidentally. If map copies are available, then they could fill the missing gaps, but the details tend to be different from one version to another. Just within a few decades, maps made from the same base reference source can show different landmarks and place names. Digital enhancement can help in the recovery process, but the results are variable and often inconclusive. Conceivably, the missing pieces of a map may have been separated deliberately. Maybe a treasure belonged to a group of people and they split the treasure map into pieces among themselves in order to avoid any one person stealing the entire hoard. Maybe a ritual artifact or site would require a group of people to access or to activate, or maybe a group decision was considered the best way to prevent any single person from gaining too much power or authority. These hypothetical scenarios occur often in fiction and fantasy, and they work effectively even without clarifying every detail of the backstory. If these events had occurred long ago, prior to the current narrative story, then the full details would not even be remembered anyway, and the incomplete backstory effectively enhances the sense of a mystery. In reality, people almost never would have split a map intentionally into separate pieces. This idea works well in fiction for creating a multi-part quest to find the pieces and to understand them, but in reality this approach would add too much extra complication and too much risk or uncertainty. Quite easily, at least one of the pieces could become lost or destroyed. Sometimes, with ancient and modern maps, the essential parts of the map's legend, scale, or north arrow were printed on just one page or on one part that could go missing deliberately or by accident. Sometimes these map key elements were understood implicitly by the cartographer and possibly by a few other people. The original field records or first drafts may not have included these details. Whether deliberately or not, these aspects of the map-making process can create the result of a secret code. The key or code for understanding a map might be discoverable by people who happen to know certain special information and therefore are considered worthy of using the map. For instance, a compass bearing could be ascertained by knowing the direction of wind blowing on a flag or a ship's sail as illustrated on a map. Other pertinent knowledge may involve the words of a local or regional folktale or song, especially if these traditions were linked with landmarks or places in a map. 
In northern Guam, I wanted to verify the locations where archaeological sites and excavations had been reported back in the 1920s. The maps and notes of Hans Hornbostel showed ancient stonework ruins, burial features, and the remnants of a Spanish Jesuit outpost, as well as a ritual cave site. One map in particular has attracted considerable attention because it showed the locations of special features that no longer are visible here today. They last were recorded in the 1950s, and then they no longer were visible in the 1960s. By itself, this map includes no north arrow and no standard measurement scale. However, anyone who visits the general vicinity will know immediately about the positions of the beach and the cliff as labeled on the map, and then the north direction can be approximated. Looking closely, two length distances were recorded, but they were not drawn at realistic scales for the map as a whole. One short line segment was indicated as 250 yards, while another longer segment was indicated as only 200 yards. In this case, Hans Hornbostel probably had measured or approximated those lengths of distances as a general frame of reference, but the map in its entirety was not a realistically fully scaled representation. On a separate page, Hans Hornbostel had drawn another map at a larger scale of the north end of Guam. Here, the approximate position of one site in particular was indicated, and the label matches with the site number on the other map. When used separately, these two maps are vague and not helpful in showing the location of the specific site. When used together, then the details begin to emerge. Moving back to the detailed map view, two distinct areas were recorded. One area included the surface visible stonework ruins and an excavation area approximately at the middle of the natural point along the coastal landform. Another area was at a position somewhere to the northwest and closer to the beach, marked with the words, Ruins of Old Spanish Block House. Today, these features no longer are visible on the surface due to apparent bulldozing, probably during the middle to late 1950s. I was able to approximate the vicinity of Hans Hornbostel's work of the 1920s. Next, my new excavations in this area confirmed the traces of an old excavation that had been backfilled and then covered by modern overburden. I looked at older survey maps and aerial photographs of this area compared with modern-day satellite imagery and remote sensing datasets. I found a consistent result of a disturbance anomaly in a position that approximated the old Spanish blockhouse. Pieces of rubble and other findings were on the surface here, and test excavations revealed that indeed this place at one time had been occupied as a living surface and then later bulldozed. The old living surface contained materials typical of the late AD 1600s, and specifically including Spanish introduced items of glass, iron, and high-fired ceramic fragments. This area most likely related with part of an early Spanish Jesuit missionary outpost. During the late 1600s, the Jesuits had created a school and a chapel in this area. The surviving records were vague and in some cases contradictory about the location, the purpose of the structures, and the history of what happened here. Partly, the lack of detail may have been deliberate for controlling the historical narrative of the Jesuits from their own perspective. The place seems to have been burned down possibly twice during violent confrontations with the local indigenous communities. Ancient maps from the late 1600s or early 1700s were drawn at a large scale without enough detail to discern the location of these specific buildings here, although the general place was identified as a traditional village, or in some cases as a Jesuit missionary site. In the later records of this site since the 1940s and continuing even decades later after the site had been bulldozed, then the ruins here were described as part of a Casa Real, or royal house. The reasons for describing a royal house were not mentioned, and perhaps these words were understood to imply something different at the time. In any case, this association was not part of the original 1920s documentation of a more ambiguous 
Spanish blockhouse that could link with any of the vague Jesuit records from the late 1600s. In this same survey area of northern Guam, Hans Hornbostel recorded another site location described as a cave situated in an upper limestone terrace. This map awkwardly cannot be aligned with Hornbostel's other large-scale map of the same area. However, this map shows a few additional reference elements, such as the multiple natural terrace levels of the limestone terrain, and the specific mention of the elevation of the next terrace higher above this cave. Another useful element is the nearby roadway, including a distinctive bend in the road that potentially could be compared with other maps. Some years after Hans Hornbostel's work of the 1920s, the road system had changed. A few new roads were created and some of the older roads fell into disuse, although the traces of the old road beds still are detectable on the ground today. Additionally for this cave, Hornbostel described the surroundings and the access by climbing up a vertical cliff. Plus, he recorded an interior map sketch and an excavation profile of his work in the cave. By tracing all of these clues together, I could verify the cave where Hornbostel had worked in the 1920s. The interior still retained visible traces of the old excavation trench through the thick layer of bat guano. My new inspection revealed a pictograph of a human figure typical of the period of approximately AD 1000 through 1700 and consistent with Hornbostel's findings in the old trench excavation. Hornbostel did not record this pictograph, and in fact several aspects of the cave were not recorded in details. The recording was quick and basic at the scale of the entire cave, while several of the internal details simply could not be represented at this scale of the map that Hornbostel had drawn in the 1920s. Going back even farther into the past, ancient maps can appear to be distorted and bizarre, partly due to the mapping equipment and technology at the time. Typically, those cartographers made direct sightings of only some points, and they may have measured or estimated only approximately. Next, they interpreted or interpolated about the missing or interconnecting parts with varying degrees of creativity. Map makers often borrowed from each other to fill their gaps. Some areas were uncharted without known public reference examples, thereby prompting imaginative representations. These imaginary and creative elements in older maps greatly influence the artistic maps in works of fiction and fantasy settings. In some cases, trade routes, especially at sea, were regarded as top secret information, and therefore the maps or charts were rare and often encrypted. In practice, the sightings and compass bearings could be encoded in numbers and words, and a graphic depiction on a map was not always necessary. In my view, these aspects would translate well into fiction and fantasy settings. I should mention that maps do not need to be committed into sheets of paper or parchment. They could occur in other forms, such as mentioned in codes of numbers and words, as well as in abstract references of folk tales and songs that link with a landscape. Other traditions, such as in Micronesia, involve knowing about the directions of winds and wave patterns, coordinated with the knowledge of the positions of other reference points, together represented in the traditional stick and shell charts. Conceivably, maps or general geographic space could be represented in statues, cave art, and other possibilities. I would encourage to maintain an open mind about how maps could be represented in different ways. Ancient maps can offer so much information not only about the places that were depicted, but also about the people who made and used these maps. What are some of your experiences with using ancient maps, and what parts would you like to explore more? Thank you for watching here. I will see you in the next video.